Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Idonjo Live, the place where classical music happens. It is Tuesdays with Tom, or better now known as Song and Beyond, the cooperation between the Hamsong Foundation, my Hamsong Foundation, and the idonjo.com streaming platform, which is extremely exciting. Uh, welcome to those who are also visiting on the Hamsong Foundation Facebook website, which is a lot of fun. This conversation is being recorded and you can visit it later if you don't happen to be live, which means that this greeting will be when you're not live and after you came and we were live now. Never mind, you get the idea. You can have a good time, a good time coming in and watching this. My guest this evening is, uh, my goodness, if I'm the ambassador of song, she's the queen of song. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that I do in the song repertoire that I don't check to see if this woman, Professor, Doctor, 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 Professor, Professor, <laughs> Susan Yowens, <laughs> has written about it. Because if she's written about it, she is definitely going to take me in a direction that I probably haven't thought about, hopefully reinforce what I have thought about. Uh, anyway, with no further ado, look at the bottom of your screen, Professor, Doctor, Susan Yowens. It's just such an honor and pleasure to see you this evening and, and to have you here with us. Well, of course, it's your daytime. You are in the Chicago area and I am in the Austrian area, which doesn't matter. It's just kind of fun that we can do this. We are going to have a very lively discussion, get to know you a little bit personally, and we're going to dip our little toes into a little bit of Schubert and probably a great deal of Wolf. Now, to in all in, in full disclosure, we also this month are doing a series of people who wrote shows for the radio shows that the Hamson Foundation did with WFMT. And we were lucky enough that Susan Yowens agreed to write a Wagnerian and post-Wagnerian song school program that we then put a listening list together. You can hear all of these programs, by the way, on the Hamsong Foundation under probably, I think there's a, it looks like Hollywood Squares when you go there on different projects. The radio programs, there's one called uh, Song Mirror of the World in which this program would be. And there was also a series called Song of America. They are completely accessible, free of charge to anybody who's interested in these two 13-hour uh, programs, and one of which is with our guest tonight, Susan Yowens. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing just fine. It's such a thrill and a privilege to be part of this. I'm really well, it's very excited to have you. I'm great. My sister I'm, I'm so happy. used to say I could talk the ears off a donkey about <laughs> leader. So getting a, any chance to do so is welcome. <laughs> Well, um, consider me the donkey. Uh, I, I've, I've been called worse, I can promise you. So I'll, I'll be the donkey. First of all, just to get to know you a little bit, I mean, I've known you pretty much as Notre Dame, somewhat St. Paul as an author, pretty much the Chicago area. Is that is that where, you, where you're from? Where did you start and where did you go to school and how long, that kind of thing, if I may ask? I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Ah, and I really, I think, first became interested in leader when I was in graduate school. But before that, I had a grandfather who was Dean of English at the University of Texas at Austin. A All right. wonderful, wonderful human being. And he would get together with Miss Mary Malone at the University of Texas bookstore every week and put together a package of books and poetry to send to his twin granddaughters in Houston. So my interest wow. in poetry goes way back. And I, then- when now, did, was, you, did you study musicology in school or did you study, no. were you gonna be a, were you gonna be a pianist? Were you gonna be a singer? I was gonna be a pianist. All right. I studied with an incredible teacher at a fabulous school. Southwestern University is the right. oldest university in Texas. And at the time it had a protege of Stokowski a woman with the wonderful name of Drusilla Huffmaster. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> she was an 
unbelievably good piano teacher. And my sister and I really wanted to study with her. And when we arrived, we found that a native of the town had just returned from completing his PhD at Harvard. And he was teaching music history. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those musicologists, he's still alive, still my inspiration, Ellsworth Peterson. Yeah, legendary name. Oh, he's <clears throat> incredible. And he's one of these people who believes that musicology and a love of performers and performance should be absolutely tightly intertwined. He was a fantastic organist. He loved all kinds of performance. So it was a bit of a shock when I discovered that not all musicologists are like that. <laughs> yeah, you speak from my heart. We have to say, I mean, it reminds me what, how you're describing is how I would describe Wiley Hitchcock and, and Donald Mitchell, you know, and this marriage of, you know, informed performance. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the musicologists get a bad, a bad rap. You have to, I think, I think even Elizabeth Schwarzkopf said to me once, you know, musicology is really more ology than music, isn't it? <laughs> and there's an argument to be leveled. So I, I sympathize <laughs> completely with your story. So at any rate, he sent me with great trepidation on my part to Harvard for grad school. Oh. And it was wonderful and horrible in equal measure. Cause you can imagine just how friendly academe was to women at the time. Oof, oof. So, yeah. but the library, the musical scene, oh my God, it was amazing. Yeah. I made friends for life there. I studied voice. I sang in an amazing uh, special choir of 16 people. I love it. And we sang everything. <clears throat> we sang the complete works of William Byrd. He adored Heinrich Schütz, so we sang everything Schütz ever wrote. It was just, it was such a music education. It was mm. amazing. But musicology at the time was archival work on mm -hmm. medieval and Renaissance music. That's what mm -hmm. you did. And I found that stuff you know, it's valuable for people who love it but I wasn't taken in mm. by it at all. I just wasn't drawn to it. So I wrote a dissertation on a prescribed subject that had to be at least 200 pages. Mine was 200 pages in one sentence. <laughs> I, I, I haven't had a copy of it for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then I immediately, once I was out, I went back to my first love, which was late 19th century French yeah. song. Ah, right. That was where I first got started. I didn't know that. Yeah. My first publications were all about Forêt and Debussy. Right. Then when I was 30, I was in Boston for the summer doing research and I went to a performance of Winterreise and I had heard it in undergraduate school but I was too young for it and in the intervening decade lots of things happened. You become acquainted with grief and Hearing that work with Hermann Pride and Gerald Moore live in Boston Symphony Hall cracked me open like an egg. I love it. At the end of the 
concert, I was sitting in my chair weeping and the, you know, the ushers had to come along and sweep me out with the trash. Uh, and after that, I had to find out why that piece had affected me the way it did. Mm. So of course I went and read everything I could find about it. And I didn't agree with any of it. <laughs> None of it answered the question of why that work is so powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's what started the ball rolling. I love and it. I never really seriously went back to France as much as I love all that music. I've been well, you know, you, you say that somehow, somehow you with Debussy rings a bell. And I think I must have, you did publish on Debussy, mm -hmm. didn't you? Yes. I must have that in my library as well. But I, I honestly know you more from the from the German repertoire without question. But it rings, it rings a bell. And, and so who is who is Charles Jones? Is it Charles? No, mm -hmm. there's a book. Who's is it your brother or your husband? Is also a musicologist. There's a Laura Ewens. Isn't there another book by, there's a book by another Ewens brought out in which you're a writer in it. <gasps> oh, that's a book on Strauss and it's yeah. Charles Eumanns. Y -O -U -M -A -N -S. Oh, Y-O-U-M-A-N-S. My dyslexia is showing up. <laughs> that's perfectly all right. Yeah. All right, here we go. Okay. <laughs> If we could edit that, that would be gone, but it's here now forever. That's okay, fine. <laughs> yes, the book on Strauss, wonderful book on Strauss, by the way. It's Lovely. So it's, 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 it's so Cambridge, Cambridge Companion. Cambridge yeah, Companion. Cambridge Companion series. And 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 I loved as I was preparing the, the Schubert year and the recording that I did and and loved it. Now, in full disclosure, ladies and gentlemen. Um, her work on the Winterreise, I consider to be just the stake in the ground. I mean, there's a lot of writing on the Winterreise, and, and neither one of us, I'm sure Susan is not saying, that, here's the answer, here's what you have to do. But until I got a hold of your book, Retracing the Steps, and I had, and, and, because no, you know, some, there's so much writing in song that focuses on composers. And I suppose, I mean, it's a little bit when I started making records and, and Tower Records was still with us, God rest its soul, you know, and the record companies were so folk. And I wanted to do a recording of various composers on, on the desk of Wunderhorn. They said, that's not possible. They won't know what bin to put the record in. So there's been an awful lot of focus in, 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 the, in the recognition of, of, music, whether it's song music, melody, melody, or, or song, or lead, that's terribly composer-centric. And you cannot understand, certainly, Winterreiser, much less Schubert, without understanding his poets. Yes. And, and, and this is what, and, and, and his reason from, and, and reason for his poets. I mean, there's also, I, I'm going to say something, you know, the, the, so often Schubert is criticized for his ubiquitous love of any poet. And and then they concentrate on, oh, of course, the Schiller and the Goethe and, the, and whoever the 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 Heilige Pantheon is of those, and 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 sort of forgive his 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 wanderings and so forth. And I think they miss, I think they completely miss the point of Schubert's fascination with all sorts of ways to to say the story of life, to say the, the human experience in poetic language. I think he was just endlessly fascinated, whether he knew them or didn't know them, with the difference between a Zeidel or a Schober or a, without any kind of, you know, one, two, three, four, five ordering. And, and what's really a miracle in that, and this is something you talk about in, in a lot, is how he uniquely found a musical voice for each one of those poets, whether it was the giants like Goethe or the not giants like Schober or whoever else I happen to have in my head right now. Does, is, does, does, is that a good theme for you? Is that, am I on the right track with that? You're absolutely right. Yes. Schubert understood that a poem doesn't have to be an immortal masterpiece as a crafting of words right. uh, as a beautiful compound of rhythm, rhyme, meter, image. 
you know, as long as a poem <clears throat> had an interesting idea, right. a concept that he could turn into music, something of that sort, yeah, uh, he would pounce on it because music is going to turn poetry into prose anyway. This is a huge point, Susan. I mean, mm -hmm. you, music is going to turn poetry into prose. This is such an important point, and that's not a degradation. That's part of the process. No. I like to explain that music and poetry don't need one another, but when they marry yes. and and make a very unique and it's unique in 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 the art world that it, that two independent art forms create a third art form. Song is to me an, an art form with its own definitions, just like what you like you said, this idea of, of first the music and then the words or first the words and the music is to me the, the wrong answer to a question that shouldn't be asked. Yes, <laughs> <You know>? absolutely. <laughs> Well, you can see, I mean, I just, you know, I, I, and, and, and how you take us in your books through the depth of that is what just astonishes me sometimes. How many books have you read? Do you know, um, written? Have you have them off the top of your head? I've written eight. Eight? Not 80? No. Eight. For about the last 10 years, what I find myself doing is writing chapters for friends' books of essays. Right. And I write about three of those a year. Okay. And for somebody who's getting old, in a way it's nice because it's a, a shorter scope. <laughs> yeah. It enables me to take a deep dive mm -hmm. into something that's more limited. Do you and, revisit what you've written and then and then condense it into a new theme, as it were? I don't or, or it... ever really do that because I'm oh. I'm afraid I'm always hunting for something new to investigate. And what triggers everything I do is not being able to figure out something in a Schubert or a Wolf song, there'll be something in the music and I'll be brought up short and I'll say, why did he do that? And that's what gets me going. Right. You know, why is there a reminiscence, a distorted reminiscence of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in Schubert's Stelzwerk, what prompted that? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, exactly. I mean, I've, I, I, yeah, and 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 then it's oh well, that's the fate theme, and it's like, yeah, okay, that ties it up in a bow, but you know, you know, and of course, what it does is it drives you to the poem, and 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 with the driving to the poem, you've you've got to drive to some information about about what it is, my my Matisse, Matisse, isn't it? Matison, you know? yeah. Matison. I mean, where did this legend come from? What is it? I mean, we and and, and what's so miraculous about that Zwerk is is it it's sort of the it's it's like as if it was a movie and we're watching the last minute and a half of it. You know, right. where, where, well, where did the story come from? Colleen. Yeah. And Colleen, Matthaus von Colleen is a figure I love. Yeah. Um, his death in 1824 prompted Schubert to, I think, songs that are memorials to him. Because right. Schubert knew him personally, understood how thoughtful, how just drenched in insight, songs like Nacht und Träume, one of my all-time favorite Schubert songs, are. And in Dutzwerk, I always think there's something of Schubert wrestling with feelings of competition and inferiority next to Beethoven. And that that's written into or baked into Dutzfeld in ways mm. that are so psychologically rich. And I Have... really think that Schubert is one of the great composers of psychologically insightful mm. songs. 
I, I, I couldn't, I mean, that I agree with you 100%. I, I've always loved Schubert, but I must say it's been later in my career and later in my life and probably more as a pedagogue that I've become just obsessed with this genius. And, and for precisely that reason, I just, it's just astounding to me what in a period of essentially 12 years is a, is a handbook of, of personal dilemma. Uh, right. And it just, it, 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 it just astounds me. The other thing that really gets me going about Schubert is, is, and what is a direct contradiction to this sort of pandering that we get about, oh, well, the bad poets, but that's okay because he said they're good poets, is that if, if you do that, then what are you going to do with all the different genres that he essentially created or wrote in? And I mean by ballads and strophics and half-strophics and through-composed and, and mini-operas and, and, you know, I mean, what do you do with a composer that writes Nacht und Träume? but also Der Zwerg, not to mention Der Taucher, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, or, or what I, what I love especially are the Greek antique uh, songs, uh, the songs of Those antiquity, which wonderful. Well, because, they're, and people get so crazy about Schubert. Oh, well, he's so precious. Yeah, I get that, but I'm not really into that kind of singing. And I want to say, put your, put your, your throat around the antique leader, you, any baritone, you have a look at, at the children de Diana and you tell me how, how that goes after five minutes, you know, right. you, ha these are like little arietes. They're like vignettes out of a, out of a, a dramatic scene that just has right. to, it's pop, you know, it's, and, and, and it not pop music, but I mean, it has to pop. It has to burst. It has to have a, a, a thrust behind it. And I, I mean, I've often said that if he was only known for any one of those masterpieces or any one of those genres, he'd be right. eternally known as the great Schubert. But I'm not sure sometimes we really have our head around the 600 something in all these various Gattungen and right. all these various poetic voices in a, in a man that died at 31. I right. mean, <laughs> just barely and, shy and of forget his about, 32nd birthday. I mean, can you imagine? You know, the very first Schubert song that I ever encountered, oddly enough, was Erster Verlust, which oh, yeah. is one of these, what Graham Johnson calls one pagers. And a lot of singers and voice teachers that I know dismiss them as, you know, inconsequential. But what tore me apart about that song is that Goethe's singer is mourning the beautiful lost days mm. of first love. Mm. And the song ends in the major mode that is the key of that beautiful lost love. And in a piano postlude that is one bar and one chord long, the piano very quietly says, no, you cannot bring them back. Wow. And when I realized that, I just, I just burst into tears. I thought that was incredible. Mm. And the other thing I think singers sometimes don't realize in these categorical dismissals of Schubert is how freaking difficult he can be to sing. He gives singers no quarter. Exactly. One of the most spectacular songs in the whole canon, I think, is Des Fischers Liebesgrück. It's what, four stanzas long. Yeah. Each stanza has something like four high A's that you have to leap up to softly at the end of a phrase. And I just think if you can sing that, you have a technique that can do anything. You know, I, I, I have, when I hear that, when I hear that song, you don't hear it very often. It reminds me of the, of the opening aria of the Fischer in Guillaume Tell. Yes. 
And of course, the Rossini Schubert time in Vienna, you kind of wonder, I haven't ever really played with it very much. I don't know the, the dating of it completely, but it's that same kind of, oh, 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 oh. It's fantastic, fantastic stuff. It is. And, and you mentioned Graham Johnson, and I don't, we can't, no one can have a conversation about Schubert without talking about Graham. And I know that you and Graham are, are quite bound by, by love and intelligence and scholarship and uh, his tome, of course, of the great three volumes of Schubert, much, much less the Hyperion that I'm so grateful that he reached out and invited me to be part of in, in already the early volumes. And, and, and he actually, he's the one that awakened me to the miracle of this group of antiquities. Chikalita that, that that I recorded a great video, a, a lot, or some of them for, for a volume. But what I was going to say is that you guys still stay in touch, right? You have oh, still... Yes. Of, yes, exactly. I mean, he references you and you reference him. And um, one of the things when and I had, I had Graham as a guest to Heidelberg a couple of times, and, and we had a, we had an afternoon discussion once, and it's right. I loved your email you sent me because it was exactly what I love to talk about. And that is the unknown Schubert or the forgotten Schubert or the not yet encountered Schubert or gee, you know, these 30 songs are great if you know 30 songs, but if you know those 30, why don't you know these 30 and you still right. only got 60 of 600. Right. Um, and, and of course, the other thing is that, is that is with my work in the, in the Berlin project, the, at the Boulezal, the mandate from Daniel Barenboim is to sing over until we until we quit singing all of Schubert's songs. And it's a Schubert week. It's only about Schubert with students coming and so forth. But we follow the, as we call them in German, Stemme. We call the programs that Dietrich Fischer Dieskau put together in 98 and then and then later revised before he passed. Um, so we follow his footsteps, but then with you and Graham filling in all the all the uh, all, all the holes, and in fact, this season I've invited that wonderful man, Mr. Professor Dieckmann from Berlin, who wrote a really oh, wonderful right. book in in German about Schubert and his times and so forth. My point is, believe it or not, there is a point. Is that, <laughs> I talk about talking. I, I'm supposed to be the donkey, and here I'm doing it. Um, but my point is, is that out of all of this stuff that we get so passionate about, there is still, and it, it came from, from uh, um, Graham, Graham as well, and from you, what about these songs that are not so well known? Shouldn't, shouldn't they have a better life? And I thought maybe we just have a, a quick listen to a couple of them, which lets me also show people how to use Idonjo. But the ones that just came to your mind were what? Die Gebüsche? Well, they included... A group of songs uh, that have to do with pantheism, right. sensing the divine in nature. And they include Am See to a poem by Franz von Gruckmann and the fabulous Die Gebüsche. It's unbelievable. Why every singer doesn't have that in his or her repertoire, I just don't know. And Ladies, it's another keep, keep talking. I'm going to challenge. No, no, you just have to. You have to. Uh, actually, I'm going to go here. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen here, ladies and gentlemen. Now you're looking at, you're looking at Idajo in my browser, which is a, a Safari browser. It goes in any browser. We're looking at it on the web. There is also an Idajo app which can live on your computer, but you can also have the app on your telephone, on your iPad. And when you belong to the iDadjo community, you can download, take with you. And I'm going to show you now uh, how to make uh, an entry into a playlist. So I've got Hugo Wolf because we're going to end up with Hugo, but we can also just go Schubert. We could actually even have some fun and put Schubert uh, and then put D, G, I have to make sure I get my umlauts here, Bücher. Right, and here we have the Dugabusha, we pull it up. By the way, this is kind of fun. Did you know where is, uh, okay, we have Susan Danko, That's just to pick up something, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll go down here. No, she could have done that. This doesn't look right to me. I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go to the book. You see this D648, 646? If you know the the Deutsch number, that's the D number is how we how we uh, how we do the numbering of Schubert as well as Opus, but if you just put in D, 646, watch what happens. Oh, come on, you can do it. Don't make a liar out of me. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, it's not happening. Maybe I'll go down here and put in, uh, okay, I got I got more clever for myself than I'm allowed. 
So we're going to go back and do Gibushi. Here's 646 Gibushi. Now, I, you can, these are all the various recordings and there aren't very many. You're absolutely right. What I want to show you is that, for instance, if you wanted to hear Benjamin Apple or Matthias Gurna, and you push on this thing, it'll ask you for to create a playlist or add to a playlist. I made a playlist called Susan Yohan's Playlist. And, and by the way, that, that playlist will live on Idajo from tomorrow on, as well as on our Hamsong Foundation Facebook site. So you can have some fun with that, right? So if I go to my playlist and I open up her playlist, I will have that song that I just put in there called Digabushi. Let's just drop the needle for a minute or so and see what happens. That hurts to do that, but I have to get this back out. I As you know. can see, I've already put a list here, and because I, I, I don't want to lose. I mean, we. I mean, we could go on. We could make this a Schubert, a Schubert project, but I think we've hit some wonderful things. That there's. I mean, Amze is in there. Uh, what is it? Oh, oh, Bertes Lied in der Nacht. You caught me by surprise on this one. We have to have a listen to this. We. This is just too much fun. <laughs> Uh, this is really just too much fun. We go, I'm going back in. Here's where. I, so I actually found, and because you, you said you're passionate about Why are you passionate about this? I'm passionate about it because I only rediscovered it with new eyes and ears a little while ago. And I realized that it's an incredible exercise in a poetic idea that becomes a musical working out or a, a series of musical gestures. And the same is true, by the way, of Digabusha, because yes, yes. the kind of romanticism that that song hymns is all about becoming, constantly becoming and evolving into mm. something else on the way to the infinite, to the mm. one unity that brings everything together. Now, Schubert was criticized sometimes harshly for being, quote, addicted to modulation. <laughs> yes, I true. think that's a good thing. Well, and actually, that, I, I did, but th those are contemporary criticisms of him which actually one could argue is a little bit ahead of his time because it's exactly that that keeps him more contemporary today. You bet. And Bertus Lied in der Nacht is another one of these, what I call the radical Schubert, like Giga Busha, I love where it. Where he's just doing 
compositional, making compositional decisions that are way ahead of his time. I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna confess, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I've ever heard this song. Can you imagine? I'm thrilled that we have Dame Janet Baker and Jill Moore. And by the way, that was Matthias Gerner and Metzmacher before, which was quite fun. Uh, let's have a listen, let's just drop the needle. I'm sorry to interrupt that. I mean, what is beautiful singing, but I'm sorry that those last phrase, if you just dropped that last phrase and said, who's the composer? I would have been hard pressed not to say young Wolf. Me too. I mean, that's astounding stuff. By it's, the way, who's the poet? Who's the poet of Die Gebüsche? The, the poet of Die Gebüsche is Friedrich Schlegel. I Schlegel. Okay. This is and, one. I mean, Franz Grillparzer. I have to ask why Bertha? Is this from a play? Yes, it's from his, well, it is and it isn't. His first successful play was a fake tragedy, a schicksalstragödie, called Die Anfrau, the yeah. Ancestress. And fake tragedies involve curses and a deterministic playing out on the way to death. Oh, you mean, you mean Italian opera? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the, the Germans have the, oh yes, the Austrians, right. Sorry, go ahead. I made my. <laughs> <laughs> so Bertha has fallen passionately in love with a robber chieftain named Jaromir and he with her. And they don't realize that they are brother and sister. This is the romantic incest theme. And in the play, which grill parts are tinkered with mightily, there's five different versions of it. And this particular version of a lullaby meant to be sung was published separately in one of those Viennese periodicals. Oh, right. But it's entitled Bertha's Lied in der Nacht. So Schubert would have known it was associated with this fate tragedy. So ah. what Schubert does with this is distort musical time and space so that you don't know what the hell key you're in half the time because there's such a heavy veil of chromaticism. Mm, mm. There's an enharmonic shift to signify change from death to life or life to death. And most of all, everything is a working out of that Erde-like Mm. Wagnerian figure you hear in the piano introduction. Mm. Mm. It's actually very stringent. It's the workings of fate mm. turned into music. 
You've, you've, it's wonderful. So, and you've just said the perfect setup because we've got, and this is also what I love is the interconnectivity and handing off of genius from genius to genius. Nobody yes. just lives in isolation. I once said to Luciano Berrio, you know, without Leuve, I don't think Wagner would have come up with his operas. I thought he was going to throw a book at me. He just, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, how can you say such a thing? But I mean, just what you right, said, this very. You know, and I remember doing the duet with 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 of uh, the Faust duet with Marty McLaughlin and Graham when we made the record. And and Graham stopped me and said, "Do you hear this?" And he played this chord, and I went, "Yeah." And he said, "If I add the C sharp, it's Tristan." <laughs> and this is like what forty years or thirty years before Wagner. I mean, <laughs> it was it was just it was just wild the kind of the things that you can do. So we've got pre-Wagner becoming Wagner and our show with you was actually Wagner's influence on on Lieder. I wanted to ask you as we go into that I mean you know Schubert and Wolf we we tend to hold up as the two great poles uh, of course everybody loves Sch Brahms but Brahms and Wolf are of completely different aesthetics as it were we can we can talk about what about the guys in the middle one of my favorites uh, uh, is is Robert Franz. Yes, not, I was just going to say that. Not for Lisa, the fact that we have the same birthday, not actual year, ladies and gentlemen, but but the same day. Uh, I am getting old, but not that old. And <laughs> Franz, was, Franz was loved by these guys. Wagner thought a great deal of him. Franz Liszt kept him alive uh, because he was very poor at the end part of his life. But, you know, Lottie Lehmann and her farewell recital, a full... 40% of her recital was Franz Lieder. And we really don't hear Robert Franz. I'm going to do a show on Robert Franz because I think it's, it's, it's just too, it's just too important. But, you know, are there, as we, I do want to go really get to Wolf and, and the post Wagnerian show that we didn't let you talk about that. But if you could take us from Schubert through that, let's leave Schumann and his genius and the development of the piano lead alone. But you know what I mean? Can, can, how did how like I said, nothing comes from alone. How how did this mutation, this harmonic invention, become a a, a big part of of lead singing or, or writing? Well, Schubert certainly had a massive effect on composers of the eighteen thirties and forties mm -hmm. that we no longer hear very much of. Who today knows the name Franz Lochner? Yeah, exactly. He wrote some wonderful songs. He really did. Every time I play my favorite Lochner songs for people, we have what I call the wow erlebnis. They go, oh my God. And then there is... Johann Vesk von Pütlingen, who nobody be, be, has heard of. Be careful when you say that word. Would you like to talk one more time? Johann was? Johann Vesk, V-E-S-Q-U-E, -E, von Pütlingen. I love it. He umlaut you, T-T-L-I-N-G-E-N. Yeah. Pütlingen, Pütlingen, yeah. He I love it. sat the entirety of the Heimkehr, all 88 of Heine's Seriously. To of music Heine's... in a massive collection. <laughs> wow. Then, of course, there's the influence of Schubert on people like Clara Schumann, whose Lorelei is her response to the Earl King. Exactly. That is absolutely, she composed it after one of the Hüttenbrenner brothers showed her an autograph manuscript of Earl King, or maybe gave her an autograph manuscript. I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe that's just me wishing somebody had given me an autograph manuscript <laughs> of Earl King. But, you know, you, you listen to Lorelei and you immediately know what was the spark plug for that song. And then uh, you have... Cornelius? 
uh, Peter Cornelius. Right. And um, Liszt. Liszt, who of course is instrumental in making Schubert songs known in France. He and a couple of French singers were major propagandists for mm -hmm. Schubert. So uh, Liszt is crucial in this whole story. Uh, Daniel uh, Barenboim once said to me, if, if, you want, if, you, if you want to make sure that you never sell more than 10 records of a Lita disc that you want to make, just do Franz Liszt. <laughs> Everybody's oh. completely crazy and, and won't, you know, they, they, everybody's allergic to Liszt. I, I was going to say, and we're going to go into Wolf. I mean, because I, I, you just take us right in here. But if I said, if I'm, if I'm, without Liszt. Well, you can't have Wolf without Liszt. And, and, but, and, and both of them seem to be so deadly for the quote unquote box office. If I send in a, I mean, if somebody asks for a recital, I say, well, I'd like to do, you know, this. And I send maybe a half a recital as Hugo Wolf, which is difficult. A half of, you know, Wolf is so specific. It's difficult what you can have on the front or back half, what composers you can mix with Hugo Wolf is, is, is a, that's another question. But right. presenters have often said, our, our public just won't come. They, they don't want to hear Wolf. They don't want to know about it. It's too difficult. It's too, oh. it's too esoteric. It's too intellectual. And, and, you know, scholars like you and performers like me and a lot of my colleagues, we just kind of go, what happened? I mean, Wolf was very hot for a while and very loved and he accepted. Was. But Something I don't know how, I don't know how he, be what happened? Years. Yeah. What I happened? don't know, but something impelled one of these bad swerves in fashion. And uh, I think a real dumbing down in what you can expect mm. of an audience. And another thing ah. that's crucial that I complain about every day of the week, if you take music instruction out of elementary schools and junior high schools, you cripple future listeners. Absolutely. When I was growing up, music was an integral part of primary and secondary school education, and it's not anymore. But even more than just future listeners, I mean, let, let's talk about the value of the experience of learning music as a language. Music is a language. And music informs us of, of relational thought, of logical thought, how, how the scales are built is a mathematical proposition. Opening your hearing, and, and of course, the mathematical positions and the, you know, the music of the spheres is not just a, a clever title. I mean, the, the old guys knew what they were talking about, that there are these, these realms of awareness that music enlivens young people to do. It actually invigorates their building of a, of a worldview of who they are in right. the world and what the world is. I, so, it, you know, I, I get so, I, like you, I, I just shake my head and say, how, why would you want to prosecute a cultural suicide, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and then, a, and then um, yeah. Music has a grammar and a syntax out of which meaning is built. But and the fact that, that a portion of that meaning is nonverbal has expands the mind in ways I don't think we yet fully understand. I can't imagine a world without music. That's my idea of hell. It really yeah. is. Well, sometimes in elevators, I feel like I'm in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be a snob here, but I guess it's not just to get on the elevator music thing. What, what, what worries me sometimes is how ubiquitous the sound of a kind of music is so that we have become numb to actually listening to when it actually means something. And right. I don't mean just classical music. I mean, you know, there's, there are great moments in jazz and pop music and folk music, yeah. you know, and, and, and actually, and that's the other thing about teaching kids the musical language. So they become alert to the specificness of actually listening. I'm having this experience, you know, I've got this wonderful one-year-old grandson, you know, crawling around the house here, and I put on some nice tunes or even some Mozart, you know, and his ears just pop up and he wants to, 
figure out what all that is, you know, and it, 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 you, I think it's so, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's wonderful, but it's, I think it's important. And I think we underestimate how important the, the ubiquitous experience of a musical moment uh, right. actually can be. I'm not trying to get everybody to be Schubert scholars by, by any stretch of the imagination. So tell me, I mean, I don't want to run out of time here and we're going to, we, you and I could talk for two hours and, and, and if I may, I'm going to just embarrass you and tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Susan and I are going to have some wonderful conversations and we're going to have it on the Hampson Foundation and hopefully another visit with the Adagio, but there's just too much you need to teach us. And I want to give you that platform. I, I would love to have the, the, the one hour Schubert conversation, me as, as either the donkey or more appropriately the fly on the wall <laughs> and let you and Graham Johnson just, and just you know, walk yourselves through the stratosphere yeah. of Schubert. I do want to get to this notion of post-Wagnerian tonality, if you will. That sure. sounds a little bit halfalutin, as we say. What I mean is the use of musical dissonance and element and inventive harmony, which I guess we like to land on Wagner's desk, as a mode of expression, as a as a wider tool to examine the inner feelings of people's lives as they're experiencing this, and I think that's is that's what we were trying to get in your show. That that's been your passion, right? You bet, you bet. Well, and run with that. Teach Rolf, me. When he was a student, a very rebellious student at the Vienna Conservatory when he was in his teens, mid-teens. He would sit at his Aunt Bertha's, that name again, at his Aunt Bertha's harmonium, her parlor harmonium, and he would experiment with different chord progressions, with different ways of getting from point A to point B Mm -hmm. in the most interesting manner possible. And thereafter, he can use, he can take the relationship of one key to another or one harmony to another or one tone to another and just make it work wonders. Mm. The beginning of his song on eine Eoshafe, to an Aeolian harp, yeah. the first simultaneity you hear is the singer's G sharp right. against an F sharp minor chord with A at the top. Oh my goodness. And that dissonant stare yeah. tells you before you even get two measures into the song, that it's something poignant, something about loss. Mm. And then in Auf eine Christblume, another song I adore. Un unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I, 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 talk about it. I did, I found it and I've got it and we'll have oh, a listen good. to it. It, it, is just, it is just breathtakingly out there. <laughs> it's stunning. Now, one of it's the a, many, yeah. It's a Murica poem. Yes. Uh, and Murica was in some ways uh, a muse mm. for Wolf because both of them traffic in a Shakespearean panoply of different characters. Mm. and genres and types. And Wolf just fed on that. So Auf eine Christblume is a poem in which the pagan world of fairy, of elves, of magic, comes together with Christian symbolism in the guise of a hellebore, a kind of flower mm. Mm. that is white with purple spots, symbolic mm -hmm. of Christ's blood on the cross. Mm. And an elf comes out at the end and sees the Christbluma and understands that it's sacred 
and then scurries away. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds about this, <laughs> but one of Wagner's famous innovations is of being in two keys at once, the double tonic complex. And Rolf, who worshipped Wagner, who burst into tears after a performance of Parsifal, his friends found him on a bench outside, sobbing his heart out. So Wolf does this fabulous double tonic where neither key is predominant in Auf eine Christblume. And the symbolism is just breathtaking. It is absolutely. You have to, we're going to listen to a little bit of this. I found it of an Chris Blumer. Let's see who I found. Oh, that were not too bad. Elizabeth Schwarzkopf and Gerald Moore, will that do? That actually, I think, do. Ah, I, it doesn't say this here, but I think actually this was part of the Wolf recital with Wilhelm Furtwängler on the piano. All right, let's wow. have a listen. Yeah, exactly. That's so cool to do that. I mean, this is just... It's just beautiful. <laughs> well, it, it's its beautiful, but it is so unbelievably musically inventive. Um, and this is going to be part of his... I mean, this is part of his mature works. Murderka was one of the was the first books. So the, the Murderka book is what, 87, 88? It's 88, right? He, 88. He actually did some earlier Murderka settings in 84, like Mouse Fallinge Brüschlein. Right. Which are wonderful. But right. it was January of 1888 that he just went to town. Yeah. And and the and the Murica book, I mean, he would stick he would stick with with a poet. I mean, he he just was besotted with Murica. After Murica was Eichendorf, wasn't it? Right. And then after Eichendorf was Goethe. And then, of course, comes the Spanish Zita book on the Italian Zita book on then the great collections at the end, including the Michelangelo. But we tend to orient, just like I did, we tend to orient uh, Wolf in his, his poem books, right? His poet's books. And if I may, also part of this, uh, if you might even be watching on the Facebook page of the wonderful Hugo Wolf Academy, which you are uh, sort of the genius loctis of, of this new Wolf series, in which you have, as far as I can tell, really in, in a very expansive way for the first time, taken Wolf and liberated him from his various composers and focused on thematic 
a theme, a thematic repertoire or, or, or poems, regardless of poet and, and, and regardless of year, uh, which I find, you know, I had never trusted myself to do that. I'm quite besotted with the Murica book. I think the Murica book is just oh, a, a miracle. I, it's you know, a I would love to say that. Island. Island. I mean, it's just exactly. I mean, if, if I had to only pick one of, of I love the Murica, I'm quite fond of the Eichendorf. I'm, I'm deeply humbled by the Goethe. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a little nervous about singing the Michelangelo because they feel like that should be sort of the last thing you sing before you walk off and get in the car and, and go to your retirement home. Uh, I'm not ready to do that, but um, tell us a little bit about this, how, how you've worked on the, on the, on the theme working, because it's, it's a lot of recitals. I believe it's part of a, an, an attempt by the Hugo Wolf uh, um, Society or, or Academy to present all of the Hugo Wolf song in a particular time frame. Can you tell me all about the project? Well, I think the thematic groupings are largely the work of their fantastic chief pianist. Uh, oh, forgive. Um, so all all credit, I'm blanking on his name, which is awful. Oh, that's embarrassing. Yeah, I don't know either. I apologize. I he's thought that this year. He's incredible. He's so wonderful. Okay. Well, the good news is we can absolutely tell you with total conviction from both of us that the Hugo Wolf Academy in, in, in Stuttgart is... A, a, a place of where miracles happen. Isn't and, it great? It really Yeah, I mean, it's is. incredible. I'm, I'm very honored to be associated with and, him and, and, and to have received And this wonderful pianist is somebody <laughs> who sort of goes back in my past because we were both at Ravinia together. Ah. And somebody I shall leave nameless was singing Die Schöne Mürren as if it was Watzek. <laughs> and I was in the audience imploding. Uh, you know, I, I leaned over to him and said, they'll be sorry when I learn how to breathe fire. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've been dear friends ever since. And, you know, the whole idea of organizing programs by theme is something that I've been thinking about mm. since the time 25 years ago that I suggested somebody group Wolf's many serenades and sing them as a grouping. Right. Because they range from the philosophical serenade mm. to the comic, to the wistful, to the death serenade, they run the gamut. They, they're a performance of love in mm. all sorts of different stages. Mm. So, and of course, uh, one of my favorite groupings in the Wolf programs is Nacht und Träume, because it's a nod to Schubert. Right. And Wolf does that a lot. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite Wolf songs is Denk es o Seele. Truly. Because I think I discovered something about it that maybe nobody else thought of. So I feel like I own it. It's mine. Okay, okay tell us. It has an, a very enigmatic piano introduction and maybe we could hear that piano introduction yes and i hope everybody who listens to it says what i've sung this often i love it Isn't and we have eric verba eric verba and umgard seifried that's not too uh, bad that's terrific here we go
Okay, why are we fascinated? Why are we fascinated to that point? We're fascinated to that point because that introduction and what becomes of it is an enigma. Yeah. I don't think anybody can sound octave B flats in exactly the same register as Schubert's ear built without calling up the ghost of that song. Wow. And since I think that Eobilt's the, the beloved in Schubert's reading of that poem is dead. So I think the singer of Den Casozela hears these tolling bells of death. Mm -hmm. And in response to it in the treble register, in the higher conscious portions of the mind, above the level of this unconscious death nail, yeah. or, uh, proposes two different solutions to where those B flats might come from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does it come from D minor, which is a death key ever since Mozart's Requiem? Or is it from the pastoral key of F major, mm -hmm. the key of the pastoral symphony? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, in this poem, the singer is doing something almost impossible. He's trying to come to terms with the thought of his own death mm -hmm. as the part of a beneficent cycle of life. Mm -hmm. in which things die and from which grows the next generation. But it's extremely hard to do to face one's own mortality. Mm -hmm. So he's only semi-successful at it. But the piano introduction is a way of posing the question how am I to understand this? And to yeah. me, that's gigantic. It is. Do you have on the top of your head what the temple marking is? Because this, and I would expect this, Eric, even though it says 2003 here, Eric Verba and Ermgard Zefri, this is going to be the 50s recording. Right. And this, this is about as slow as I have ever heard anybody sing this. And I've sung this more with orchestra in Wolf's orchestration. Right. And what you hear is usually bum, 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 ba, da, 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 rum, bum, 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 ba, da, 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 as if the ya, da, 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 is a release of the, of the octave. But actually, I agree with you completely that it's actually bum, 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 bum. And then what happens is the reflection. De right. Da, da, de. right. Bum, bum, bum. It's very interesting. Do you know what the temple marking is off the top of your head? I can't remember. I don't remember it either. It's just very curious. I think it's an it's incredible. Good. I've never. version of message. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. Which then, <laughs> but you hear it, if it gets to, you know, it's very interesting. The point is that is also is tempo is is sort of the heartbeat of the situation. If this gets too fast, it almost sounds comedic. Right. You know? Right. And, and then when you and, bring in the dotted rhythms. Yeah, exactly. And the singer sings completely different. And of course, the, the poem is deeply ironic. And you finally get to that punchline at the end, which which at too fast a tempo sounds like, you know, ha ha, gotcha. I mean, it's just bizarre, you know. It's very interesting. Should we listen to the end of it? Yes. I'm going to jump here, ladies and gentlemen. I have no. It's, it's going, don't be startled. We're just kind of jumping into the last of the song. <laughs> Okay, that's that's unfair. I'll go back a little farther so we hear the crescendo to that. My bad. I didn't plan this. Feel 
After all of that, specificity of that ending it's the right hand sustains the d minor yeah. chord yeah. but the left hand sort of strikes a death nail and then there's what the french call a neon nothingness underneath it and wolf is so careful to make the rhythm precise so mm. that you can hear that. Oh. You know, and, and, and by the way, this listening experience, I want to share with you as a professional, I've sung the song admittedly more with orchestra, which has its own other dynamic. But hearing this performance, and this is the value of listening to different performers. And, and that's also one of the fun things about Idadra. When you, when you listen to something, it shows you a whole list of all the other recordings and you have fun. I, I have a completely different reaction to this song than I've ever had before. I mean, there's a profundity in this song that that is always there, but there's just there's just much more self awareness involved in this, and, and the pleading for one to be self aware yes. to temporal time and to life and 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 death, and also the way Eric phrases the because you only usually hear bum. Bum 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 bum, and then now you're hearing bum 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 right. bum bum, which is a heartbeat. Right, right. I mean, my and goodness, it's also me. driving forward. So yeah, oh, welcome to the, I always welcome tell... to the world of leader, folks. Yes. This is this is what this is the stuff we just eat for lunch and have a lot of fun, and we try and do it. And uh, I always and, tell my students that the real estate of a song might be small compared to opera, but they strike so deep. Some of them are That's really a... bottomless wells of profundity. Well, you can, I certainly, I'm sure we agree that this, this Fach mentality that is coming to the industry of singing, that you are a oratorio singer or a leader singer or an opera singer, is for people like us nonsense. Uh, in fact, I think it's destructive. I, I, I think that any opera singer will be better on stage having learned and dealt with and continually dealing with songs. Uh, and certainly, you know, a lot of this speaking on pitch, you know, zoisel nonsense that we get in the lead side, which it irritates people, is also they would be better if they stood on stage and used their whole whole instruments and so forth. Right. It's a it's a wonderful trade of 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 Gesamtkunst, if you will. And also the idea that the lead repertoire is somehow completely divorced from from the libretti and the historical perspectives of opera librettos is also just That's wrong. Bunk. It's just it's limited. It's really is bunk. bunk. That's a wonderful word. Are you still seeing students? I see, uh, I see students at the festivals where I coach. Okay. And I'm also a reader for other institutions, theses and dissertations, if they happen to be on leader. So that's... Wonderful. That's fine. So you're not bored. I'm never bored. <laughs> what a what a wonderful we have to close this off. What a wonderful final thing to say. Any any last thing you want to say about we didn't really focus a little bit on the Wagner and we'll come back to that uh, and and the whole the whole 
tonal shift and, and use of tonality for expression, but we've covered an, a wonderful, huge umbrella of, of German leader in the 19th century. Um, you know, to be a provocative midline journalist, you know, and I've been asked this question before, why should we care? We should care because I believe that song is an essential agency to enhance our, our humanity and expand our horizons, our ability to understand other conditions, states of being that are not our own. And uh, it offers us, I think, a treasure chest of feeling in the philosophical sense of understanding emotion and human nature. And when it brings it to sounding, when music brings this to sounding life, it's so much more powerful. It's like the ending of Erste Verlust. All of a sudden, a rite of passage makes sense. Mm. And you realize that other people have felt this over centuries of recorded and probably unrecorded time. Susan Yowens, I love you. Wonderful. And I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, ladies you and gentlemen, so for joining us. No, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. To be continued. Anyway, right. thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next Tuesday with another program on song. But please revisit this, especially the last, well, revisit this. Have a nice evening. Susan, stay on. We're going to go out. Bye-bye. <laughs>